Screenless. Making a soundtrack. Track, track. Opening scene and action. Hi, Tristan. Fancy seeing you on the bus. Hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm good, thanks. Uh, the seat taken? No, no, no. Take a seat. Take a seat. Thanks very much. Bit of a problem. Um, I don't have a ticket, so I'm just kind of worried that the, the conductor's going to yeah. come round and, and, you know, chuck me off. Sometimes you can just get away with it, can't you? I'm hoping, hoping that'll be the case. Uh, oh. oh, Tickets, no. please. All tickets, please. Dan, Wait. is that... Oh, hi, guys. What, Dan, what are you doing? I'm being a conductor. I'm the conductor of the bus today, so can I have oh. a see tickets? <laughs> Tickets, please. What What are you doing? Tickets, please. <laughs> Have you got tickets? Um, uh, actually, I think I've I think I've forgot mine. Actually, Dan. Um, hold on, let me let me just check. Guys, up to a thousand pound fine. <laughs> You're kidding. Come on, we're we're friends. You're not going to actually charge me, are you? Look, the job of the conductor, collecting the tickets. No tickets. No bus ride. Dan, I think you've got a little bit confused again, haven't you? About what? This week, we're all about the conductor. Well, yes, but it's a different kind of conductor, isn't it? What, a train conductor? (laughs) I mean, how many other types of conductors can there possibly be? Dan, is there a bus conductor in the orchestral soundtrack process? Think about it. Well, maybe. Maybe (laughs) on the bus on the way in. Maybe I'm actually thinking about it. It's been years since I've seen a conductor on a bus. And I have been getting some really funny looks. So you're not even employed by the bus company? No, I just got on. I just got on. I got the outfit. I mean, check out the outfit. It's proper. I'm loving the hat and the little bag thing with the change coins. Genuine 1950s bus outfit. I hate you, butler! (laughs) (laughs) Ah, here we are at the podcast studio. Ding, ding. So, in all seriousness, the conductor isn't someone who collects money on the bus, is it? No. However, they are an exceptionally important role to make sure that the session goes well and to make sure that the composer and the film company or the TV company that's paying for it all gets exactly what they want from that session. And this week we have an amazing guest Matt Dunkley, who has described himself as the orchestral interface. (laughs) Yeah, that was awesome. (laughs) So Tristan, can you tell us something about Matt? Yeah, he's worked on big Hollywood blockbusters with Joe Kramer, Hans Zimmer, Clint Mansell, big Hollywood names like that. He's no stranger to to the studio. So with some fascinating facts about this week's guest, Matt Dunkley... Dan, uh, are you ready to um, pick up your kazoo and uh, give us some facts? The kazoo is always ready. Okay, then Fandango. Matt began playing the trumpet at the age of 10. He studied at the London College of Music and began his film career as an assistant to the orchestrator Christopher Palmer. Matt has worked on over 200 films and has long working relationships with composers Craig Armstrong, A.R. Rahman and Clint Mansell. Not only is he the inventor of the spork, but also a plate and bowl combo called The Pole. He has worked with recording artists like Dido, Elliot Smith, Tom Jones, Massive Attack and the Pet Shop Boys. His favourite colour is indigo, his favourite biscuit is the hobnob and he once rode a unicycle through the Canterbury branch of Lidl as a test run of his own version of the game show Supermarket Sweep. Alas, it's yet to be picked up by any networks. Shall we go behind the scenes then and listen to Tristan and Matt having a great conversation? Yeah, let's do that. Hey Matt, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a real pleasure to have you on the podcast talking about your role as a conductor. What is the role of a conductor in the process of making an orchestral soundtrack? Well, really, you're, you know, you're there as as the kind of interface between the booth and the musicians, if you like, you know, in its simplest sense, I guess, you know, you're you're there to represent the composer. Um, Quite often, you know, it will be something I've orchestrated anyway. So then I'm on the floor with the musicians and I can make quick changes. But but, you know, basically you're there to to represent the composer, to get the the score recorded as efficiently and brilliantly as possible so that the composer and the producers and the director all get what they need. 
and yeah it's it's definitely not an ego thing you know it's not the it's not the big maestro i'm not sort of dudamel even if i had floppy <laughs> hair which i don't <laughs> um it's you know wow. it, it's a, a very technical thing to get the soundtrack recorded as quickly and as efficiently as possible whilst keeping the composer happy and the producers happy and the directors happy so it, it's it's musical it's technical and it's also political as well because they can often be you know, I always like to uh, talk about it as like it's a sort of game of three dimensional chess, you know, and I, I think often the musicians in the live room don't quite get all the nuances of what going what's going on and why why we're doing another take. And it might it might have nothing to do with the fact of the, the music. It might be a political thing. It it might be the fact that the the composers realizing that he's gonna finish like one session early, which is which is bad form with the producers are sitting there because then they'll say, Well, why did we why have we paid for an extra session that we haven't used so there's all that kind of stuff going on too you know so it, there's a many levels go it goes on but yeah uh, uh, fundamentally it, it, it's to to get the thing recorded as efficiently and musically as possible and you mentioned that you're you know you're normally conducting orchestrations that you've done yourself if you haven't orchestrated it yourself when do you normally receive the score and and what preparations do you like to do before the actual session itself yeah i mean it's funny i when i started doing this it was always you know i was i was conducting my own orchestrations but increasingly i i, I get booked to just come in and, and um conduct other people's orchestrations which is interesting and normally you know i see the scores on the day so I, i'll get to the occasionally they'll they'll send you some pdfs the night before but you know we all know what it's like orchestrating a movie it's all <laughs> it's always last minute there's never enough time um so yeah I, I normally i normally factor in that i probably won't see anything until the day so i'll get to the the studio try and get to the studio a couple of hours before the first session and there'll be a big pile of scores waiting for me and then i'll just very quickly uh go through the scores mark them up you know very obvious things like where different instrument groups come in any tempo changes any um any tricky meters, things like that, and you know, just really basic stuff with the red pen, just to just so I'm I'm slightly ahead of the game. So when we read it the first time, I'm already I can already say to the players, watch out, bar twenty four. There's a big tempo change there. We might start and stop, but let's try and read it once and get it wrong once. You know. Have you ever sort of looked at the score and thought, oh man, this this looks really tricky, <laughs> or do you just sort of? not worry too much about it sometimes yeah and it's you know i have to say it's normally just it's, it's bad writing you know it, it's i always think you know keep it as simple as possible and needlessly needlessly complicated time signatures it's like you know where you've got like a you know a, a 15 4 or something ridiculous you know and it's, oh. it's just you know you just you lose yourself in the middle of the bar everybody loses themselves in the middle of the bar you know so <laughs> things like that it's just it's just silly or you know stuff where it's generally it happens with with inexperienced composers and some of their first gigs and they use tempo as a way to fit to picture and that's a ter yeah. that's a terribly bad thing to do <laughs> generally it works yeah. it works but it's it's really hard to play and you never really get a satisfying performance and particularly if you're in a you know in a, in a say you're in a sort of action thing and you've got a groove going and you're changing the tempo all the time forget the groove you know it just it's impossible you know and you know you're working with ian thomas once and he was going how, how can i groove when it changes every bar and it's like <laughs> absolutely right how can you you know so you know things like that where you 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 you're kind of negotiating sort of inexperienced composers as well but um yeah i mean you know generally it, it it's I've been around long enough that it's in my comfort zone, you know, and uh, and the players certainly it's in their comfort zone. I mean, they're extraordinary, you know. Uh, we're so spoiled in London yeah. with the the ability, you know. Yeah. Even when I've orchestrated something, and I think you know that's that's a pre that's a pretty tough cue. You know, you see them turn up half an hour before at Air or Abbey Road. They flick through the pad and then they go off and have a yeah. have a cup of coffee. <laughs> it's like that's that's not going to trouble me, you know. So it's um and and again, generally, you know, if it does trouble them, it's because it's not written very well for the instrument, you know. So you've got Skylar complaining that the pedaling doesn't work on the harp, or or you know, you're writing <laughs> all across the, the strings in a very fast passage so that 
that you're you know you hit every string and loads of overtones and and um, open strings and stuff so you know normally it's ineptitude on the part of the creatives rather than the, the musicians you know yeah. they, they can play anything you know they're they are extraordinary so. yeah it, it really is phenomenal isn't it um mm. how much communication do you usually have with the composer and orchestrator before and during the session sometimes you have a chat sometimes you don't it depends i mean certainly with the orchestrator if i'm not orchestrating it i'll probably have a chat with the orchestrator occasionally the composer depends whether he's in you know he's 24 hour no sleep mode but uh, occasionally you know it's uh, if it's somebody like hans he'll uh, hans zimmer he'll he'll ring you up and, and sort of tell you what he's looking for from the score and stuff like that but um it's mainly all on the day you know in when, when you play hit record and that that's when the communication really begins and that's when you shape the music and and uh really really get to it you know it and it's that's the lovely thing about working in the you know film recording industry is that you know we the the music is is on the page but that's often just a starting point you know and we we can yeah. we can adapt it and change it and you know reshape it uh live with, with the orchestra which is a fantastic luxury to have really you know and how do you communicate with those players you know it's it's it's, it's important i think isn't it as a conductor to, to be able to mm. coax the best performance from them especially given the insane time constraints yeah i mean I, i'm a i'm a firm believer that a, a happy orchestra plays better than a, a stressed orchestra you know this this you know this screaming and shouting at a band never works you know they'll they'll give you a performance but it won't be the best performance so uh you know i think there's there's times in a session you, and it, it's you know it's people management it's reading reading the room and there's times where you know you're really up against it and you've got to push and you'll you'll just be quite strict with them and you know there'll there'll be inevitable some so that, you know session musicians love um, correcting everything so you know if there's a few little harmonic rubs that are, that are just you know part of part of the thing but they always want to um correct it and make it absolutely perfect and you know and i always i say the phrase to them i said it's all right i think western harmony can take it you know? <laughs> <laughs> so you know sometimes you you know you can get you can go down a bit of a rabbit hole where there's suddenly all these little questions come in and you know that 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 sometimes it's time to push and you you getting a vibe from the booth that they're getting a bit stressed timing wise so then you push but then you know you then you take your foot off the pedal for a bit and you know crack a joke or something or have a laugh and it, it's really just reading the room you know i think you can't you can't slam them for three hours solid so you you have to you have to understand you know the high the, the fast and slow and highs and lows of, of a session and it is a it's funny, I, I've just been back in the studio, you know, just after um, all the uh, COVID-19 lockdown. We, we were just starting up and I did some sessions at Air and Abbey Road and the, the Musicians' Union have changed all the um, session times. In fact, longer breaks for um, personal distancing oh, okay. and, and all the rest of it, which is great and very helpful. But um, you kind of have this internal clock in the session you know if it's a three-hour session you know that you're building to the first break which is after about an hour and a half yeah. and then you know that yeah. you know the last 15 minutes are going to get quite sweaty and all that <laughs> but all the break times are in different places and it's really difficult to pace yourself you know we, we were doing four hours with an extra 45 minutes of break and it was it was really oh, weird wow. you know and all the musicians as well were going it's like this is a never-ending session you know they they didn't know where to where you know the final push was it, it's really interesting that you know you, you've done it so long that you, you kind of internalize that that natural rhythm you know yeah and I think it's interesting what you've been saying about reading the room because I, I, I think it's easy to see if the morale drops for instance <clears throat> if they're having to play something too many times over yeah. and over again or like you said they, if they don't know why they're they're performing something so yeah. much uh, the morale can just very easily drop off a cliff absolutely and i think that's really important that i always try and say you know if i think we've done two or three really really good takes and maybe it's quite a tiring cue you know a lot of ostinato or something and then they say oh you know can we just get one more and i i, I will ask the engineer just just to me why why are we doing one more I, th I honestly think we've got it between takes um is this a is there another thing i'm not cognizant of you know that's something going on between the director and the producers and the and the composer and, you know, I hate this safety take. 
I, so many people <laughs> do it just to say, uh, if we've got it, we've got it. Why are we doing another one? Yeah. And it's like, but, you know, a lot of, especially uh, American clients love the safety take, you know, so you, you, you have to, you have to respect that. But um, yeah, it, it, and you know, you see musicians kind of rolling their eyes, you know, they've just done an amazing performance and then you're doing a safety take and, you know, they sort of say, well, and it's never usually as good as the, as the take before anyway. No, and he said, "Well, what was what was unsafe about what we just played?" You know. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, it's you know. So you, I think you know, you certainly have to be aware and respect the musicians, and you know, inevitably, if if you play something ten times, then it, it it it's a downward spiral. And normally, you know, especially in London, the the first or second takes are keepers anyway. They're they're amazing. You know, the the reading is so good, and you because they're reading, you have that energy as well. And I think familiarity can breed contempt a little bit. And, you know, once you've played it five or six times, it suddenly it might be completely safe, but it's also it loses a certain, you know, energy that, that you get on those early takes. So, And how do you know when you've actually got a good take? Because that's really important to know. Um, are you just listening for, you know, whether it's good intonation or, uh, you know, the, the correct notes and all those sorts of things? Yeah, well, it well. It, it's two different things, isn't it? You know, it's always why I'm slightly uh, in two minds about composer, composers who conduct their scores, because I, I think what you hear in the live room and what you hear in the booth are two different things. You know, you don't get a complete picture. You normally got one ear on, one ear off uh, with a click going on, and then you probably got a sort of mono mix of a backing track. And then you're going to hear the strings close to you you know and if you've got one ear one 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 ear on one ear off if you know if you've got your right ear off then you're going to hear the cellos louder than you're going to hear the first violins because your first yeah. violin ear has got click and backing track in it so you don't get a good overall picture i don't think in the room so you have to rely on on the engineer and the booth a, a lot i think i mean you can you can feel like the energy in the room and you know sometimes we hear things they don't hear so you know suddenly so if if you're at air you might suddenly hear a um you know an ambulance siren uh, um, uh, you hear the tube <laughs> yeah, you hear the northern line rumble if it's on a very uh, yeah going up to hampstead or you, or you hear because it's right next to the royal free hospital you know you sometimes hear an ambulance siren yeah so um you know and they might not notice that in in the booth especially if you know the producer's telling a hilarious anecdote um <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh. you know so and you know you can you can see this chatting going on in the booth and it's it's not it's not the engineer but you know it's, it's if, if the director or the producer want to hold court, you can't tell them to shut up. You know, it's it's their it's their train <laughs> it's their train set. So, um, yeah. but yeah, so it, I, I always, you know, I think really it, it, it's up to the booth to tell you when they think they've got it because you know they're hearing everything. They're hearing the spot mics. They're hearing the Decca tree, and the, you know they're getting the overall picture and they're probably here monitoring with dialogue and the backing tracks at a louder level. And it's impossible for us in the live room to completely get that whole picture. You know, so you can hear obvious mistakes, but I think you know the take is a really it's a booth booth decision, and I think the problem is if you're a composer and you're conducting, then you're not. There's two things you're not getting. You're not getting that overall picture of sonically, but also you're missing out on all the politics that's going on in the booth as well. So you know you can yeah I've you know I've seen. Hans Zimmer's a master at it, you know, putting out a fire quickly if something just crops up between a producer or a director, you know, it's like, oh no, we can we can fix that after, it's fine, it's fine, you know. But if you're not there, then suddenly that mm. thing goes bigger and bigger. And by the time you've come in after five or ten minutes of a few takes, you know, this thing suddenly's become a problem and they're all chatting away. So um I guess it's all about budget as well. I mean if you're John Williams who records probably three minutes a session then he, he goes out and conducts a a, a a cue and then he'll walk back into the booth and then hear a playback. So everything takes twice as long. Whereas mm. if you're a, a mere more yeah. if you're a mere mortal and you've got to get your your fifteen or twenty minutes in a session, then you haven't got time to do that, you know. So you mentioned the folks from the booth telling you if it's a good take. Would you prefer to hear that just in your headphones, or because generally that there are two buttons, aren't there? It's two conductor and yeah. two conductor and players. I, I guess it, it varies really. Um, it depends how discreet the uh, <laughs> the people on the button are. You know, if they're a little bit a little bit harsh with their comments and ghosts then then they should just talk to me and I'll, I'll filter it but 
you know, if you're working with a an experienced engineer who you know knows knows the score, then I'm quite happy for them to talk to everybody because it just again it just saves time. You know, I reiterate what's been said, but I think you get very early on in in a block of sessions and. Um, after the first or second cue you you understand if it's going to be a problem or not and you know if the if the director's a bit uh shall we say uh, forthright in their in their opinions then that doesn't play well to the room and then you know I'll I'll quietly say to the uh engineer just just talk to me and and I'll filter it um but you you know you play it by ear normally uh, normally it's fine you know they're all grown ups but as we all know, there's some people who aren't grown ups in this industry. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's it's I think it's interesting that every session is kind of different depending on who you're working with. Because you know, I've worked with people who are very proficient at reading music, and also composers who can't read a note of music. So there's there is that chain of command when you're in the booth and you've got the composer telling you as the orchestrator um, what they want, and then you've got the orchestrator telling the conductor. <laughs> telling them what they want and then you've got you know someone like yourself telling the players what to do and you know it's that sort of thing that, that I guess can slow a session down if you're not careful yeah I think it's it's no accident really that that scoring teams tend to develop and successful composers have a very tight-knit team that they work with mm-hmm. an orchestrator and a conductor and a music editor um, because I, I think you know it's all about trust really isn't it and you know I mean I work with some composers who aren't you know, haven't gone the traditional um, classical route and, uh, you know, uh, uh, pop guys. I mean, Clint Mansell is, you know, one one in particular. He's a fantastic composer, really comes up with very, very interesting music time after time. Lovely human being as well. But he's not, he, you know, he's the first to say he's not schooled orchestrally. So he relies on mm-hmm. me to be the kind of the orchestral interface f- uh, for him. But at the same time, I've got to respect you know that he knows very clearly what he wants but he's he's not necessarily able to articulate it on on a, through a notation program so it's my yeah. it's my job to 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 find his voice in it you know and not make him feel vulnerable you know i know he he worked with some other orchestrators who very much sort of played a you know because he couldn't read that well that, that therefore they were superior which is nonsense you know um so yeah, you do get different you know styles, and then, you know then the other extreme is you know I work with someone like Nicholas Britell, who is incredibly schooled and you know fabulous you know concert pianist standard uh, player who's incredibly precise in in everything that he does. Um, so that's the completely other end of the spectrum. And I, you know it's just finding finding the respect, finding people that you like you like working with and that you like their music. You know, and I think increasingly as I've got older. I've filtered out the people I that I didn't enjoy the experience because, you know, let's face it, we all went into music because we love music. We didn't go into it for yeah. the money, did we? You know, it's no, no. <laughs> we'd have joined a merchant bank. Um, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I, I, I just think, you know, when you see some of these, these scoring teams and they're all so miserable and I just think, ugh, you know, I've done that. And it's like, yeah, I know we've all got to earn a living, but it's, it's so joyless and it should be such a joyous it, it, experience it's such a privilege you know to to work on music for for film and um it you know it's got to be fun as well you know so I, i'm very lucky that i'm you know everybody i work with now i i think i i really respect and have known for years and um you know it's it's a it pushes you you know it's no it's not easy i'm not saying it's it's all just you know happy clappy but it's satisfying and there's that that kind of mutual respect which i think is really important you know no, that's that's really interesting to hear. So, so how do you like to enjoy the finished film or TV series that you've been working on, um, or do you at all? Do you have time? Do you know, what? I normally see them. I normally see them on planes, <laughs> <laughs> which is terrible. You know, the tiny little screen like that with a, with a low rumble of an aircraft. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You, if you, you know, if you've been quite intense on a, on a film, it's almost like you've seen it so many times. You, you you need a. I always think you need a bit of a gap anyway before you see it and see, see it afresh. You know, so. For instance, Judy, you know, a, a film I worked on a couple of years back, and I, I was right in on that from pre-production right the way through to the to the end, and I'd seen it so many times and worked on every single 
part of it that you know it took me like a, a good year before i could watch it again and then and you know i watched it the other day i thought oh, it's, it's a pretty good film yeah <laughs> so but i mean yeah i mean it's, it's lovely to go go to the cinema and you know and, and and see it but it's just time isn't it you know I, yeah and uh yeah. you know give, given the choice it's, it, it's going to be my sofa rather than a, a cinema i think but uh you know how do you get experience as a conductor for session scoring i guess everybody's got a different way in you know my, my way in was I started out I was a trumpet player to begin with and uh and I kind of combined that with doing copying um with Jill Streeter in fact hand copying with Jill Streeter back in the day oh wow <laughs> did true true story um <laughs> and um yeah then I I started getting some arranging work and I, I worked with an amazing uh arranger and orchestrator called Chris Palmer and I worked as his assistant um and then I started picking up it was kind of early 90s I started picking up some pop string arranging there was an awful lot of pop string arranging going around at the time and and uh Will Malone and Nick Ingman couldn't do it all so I got <laughs> so I I did some of that yeah it, it it um yeah I did some you know stuff with Catatonia and Badly John Boy and then I did some stuff with Tom Jones and you know unlike film you know the 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 arranger you, you you're it's you it's you and the 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 producer really so uh, I conduct those sessions and um you know i remember the the first session at air being terrified you know and it was uh mm, gavin gavin wright was leading the string section he was you know isabel griffith's lead, main leader and a brilliant pop string player particularly fantastic at those sessions and he really roasted me you know because i didn't know what i was doing <laughs> but, um and uh. you know, after a few sessions with him i got better at it and then you know you 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 learn to you know develop a thick skin and and you learn the techniques and you learn that you know you standing up there you've got to know you've got to know what you're doing so um mm. and then yeah just i, I kind of learned on the job really I, I i did a lot of orchestration in films i ha i have done and and i've conducted a lot of those and done pop string sessions and live stuff and you know you you just learn on the job really but i, I can't say you know so i i sometimes lecture at, um film schools and music colleges and you get these very intense young men normally um who've got their their whole careers mapped out and i i didn't really have a clue you know i knew i wanted to do music but i thought i was going to be a trumpet player and then i was gonna be a copyist for a bit and then i suddenly realized that i was a better uh arranger than i was a trumpet player so i i i retired the trumpet and uh then you know everything and then i started doing some composing and yeah it, it's been a real sort of um unplanned journey really I, i've just said yes a lot really <laughs> oh well thank you so much this has been supremely insightful and there are so many things i've picked up just from chatting to you today so thanks for giving up your time and for joining us today matt really appreciate no, that great pleasure i'll talk shop anytime So here we are in the coda. That was a fantastic interview with Matt. Good job, Tristan. Yeah, well done, Tris. Uh, really good insights into what he has to do, what he has to deal with on a daily basis. And it's interesting because I think you could definitely say that a portion of what he has to do is uh, dealing with politics and people. Yes, mm -hmm. He's not just listening to the orchestra play and correcting them or suggesting things. He's also, as he said, the orchestral interface. He's the human yeah. buffer between the, the studio and the live room. Yeah, really interesting. What I found interesting was that most of the problems that sort of arise in the studio are maybe not creative mistakes, but sort of creative problems. So bad writing or bad orchestration. It's not the player's fault. No, or political, especially on big films. There's a lot of politics because there's a lot of money being spent. So everybody has an opinion. And having to deal with that, I think, probably is more common than having to deal with a player who's not quite up to par or mm. hasn't brought their A game that day for whatever reason. Yeah. And there are huge advantages to having a conductor who is the conductor rather than the composer mm. being out of the control room yes. where potentially he or she could diffuse some of that. Yeah, I thought that was a very interesting point. Obviously, there are a lot of extremely talented composers who mm. could also conduct as well. But to be in 
inside the control room and to be in amongst the conversation that happens in the control room is much more beneficial so that you yeah. can do some firefighting if needs be. And connecting back to what Sagan was saying in the first episode, he prefers to be in the control room simply because with hybrid scores and things like that, he wants to hear what's going to be on the recording rather than what's in the room with the orchestra. Yeah. yeah. And Matt did say that you've got your headphone on your left hand side you're going to hear a lot more celli than you are of the first violins yeah. because of the layout of the musicians. So it's little things like that that would be hard to pick up on if you were a composer conducting your own work. But that's not to say that that's right or wrong. I mean, I know Harry Griggs and Williams and people like that prefer to conduct their own music. You know, it's each to their own, isn't it, in these sort of instances? Yeah, very much so. One thing that I picked up on that was quite interesting to me was that he found that inexperienced composers were using tempo to fit music to the picture rather than time signature changes and that is a problem that I personally have come up against when I've been orchestrating and of course there's not really much you can Mm. really do about that as an orchestrator I mean you can kind of try and fix it but at the end of the day if they've gone from 120 (laughs) bpm to 50 the players are just going to really struggle with something like that. Yeah from a composer's point of view though there will always be tempo Mm. changes because you're either taking a little bit off or adding just a few but nothing ever excessive just so that you can get those hit points and everything so that they're really tight and really work with the picture the other thing is as matt mentioned the groove Mm. if you're constantly zooming up and down in tempo all the time then how on earth are any of the players ever going to groove with what's been done how are they how are they ever going to perform properly really no you can't avoid tempo changes and you shouldn't it's just when it's sort of happening so frequently that it yeah it ends up being a bit of a bind for the players yes and when it's so dramatic like you're saying going from quick tempo to suddenly very very slow yeah exactly i know we all talk about things being super last minute in in every job you know whether you're the composer or the orchestrator or the copyist but to not see the scores until the day of the recording is just yeah pretty bonkers and really you, you really have to have faith in your abilities to yeah. to know that you're going to be able to pull that off that's the level that they're working at you can't just rock up and say i'm the conductor and walk in on the day matt said i'm no dudamel <laughs> but clearly being able to turn up at a session walk in on that day and get exactly what is needed out of that music you have to be a talent to be able to do that you can't oh, just rock up and yeah. hope for the best no no and he did say that he marks up the scores like a couple of hours before you know with some red pen and yeah i noticed alistair who was on our orchestrator episode he does exactly the same when he's yeah. been conducting as well so you know that's just a thing that helps previous guest jeremy holland smith also does the same thing he did that when i worked with him and ben foster who i've worked with as well also common thing i think you know. yeah it is quite mind-boggling though isn't it that they don't see the score until the day and yet they have to get things done as quickly and efficiently as possible it just Mm. seems like wow wouldn't you see the score beforehand but then you know they might not have the score yeah i mean that just shows the level that the crazy deadlines that we're all working to often the orchestrator is working right down to the wire there was one particular time when i was doing some orchestration and copying a music prep on a job and i was literally printing the music up until five in the morning we had this session at abbey road at 10 in the morning <laughs> that's I mean, that's, wow. yeah it's just brutal cutting it that fine but that's just the way the schedules work what happened with that particular one was that the music got thrown out for the score they decided the creatives decided to go in a completely new direction so the composer had to rewrite the wow. entire <laughs> episode <laughs> from scratch after he'd got halfway through it so that meant obviously the orchestration got pushed back massively copying gets pushed back music prep gets pushed back and same with the conductor in that instance and that particular case the composer was conducting himself just goes to show how tight everyone's working yeah so that's the conductor next time we will be speaking to an orchestral player i mean they've all been really good but i'm particularly looking forward to that one because this is where we're sort of changing from people you know you can put as many dots down on the page as you want but at the end of the day it's we're doing this because we're talking about music being created in a live setting This is where the music really comes to life with the the orchestral players. So there we go. That's another episode in the can. And uh, are we still on the bus? We're on the bus still, yeah. I was wondering, Dan, why you were standing up the whole episode. In this outfit? (laughs) The trousers are so tight I cannot sit down. Uh, Oh, hang on a minute. Tris, you. Uh, You haven't got a ticket. Right, back the bus up. Come on, stop. Everybody stop. This man does not have a ticket. (laughs) You did not buy a ticket. You got to get off this bus. Okay, I'm leaving the bus. I'm leaving the bus. Right, bus driver, we can go now. (laughs) That's a wrap. That's a wrap.
How do you find us? Makingasoundtrack.com will tell you all you need to know. Links to the podcast, social media links, and there's information about us too. If you're enjoying the podcast, it would make our day if you could give us a positive rating and or review. And if you enjoyed this episode, hit that share button and recommend it to someone else. That's all for this week. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, uh, hi, Tristan. Is this seat taken? Uh, actually, it is. Um, please, please, could you oh. sit there? <laughs> 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 yeah, f*** off, Gareth. <laughs> well, f*** you very much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Should we start that again?